Well, good morning. I am Pastor Andrew, if we've not had the pleasure to meet yet. And uh, my prayer is that uh, not only will we have this time in the gospel this morning, but that I don't put anybody to sleep that has had breakfast and a full belly. Tyler and I talked about that this morning. So I have a challenge this morning, all right, to feed you with the word and then also not put you to sleep with the food you ate. Um, And uh, it is a a joy uh, for the opportunity for our students to to lead and to serve. And I pray this morning that uh, you would continue to engage and support them uh, in their faith journey and their faith walk. And we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. Um, But I would like to start us off uh, with a word of prayer if I could. So if I could invite you to please go to the Lord with me. Heavenly Father, we come this morning to your word. We seek you, Lord, even in the ways that we might not want to, the ways that we might not know how to. And I pray, Lord, this morning that as we hear your words and your prayer for us, that you would open our hearts and that you would open our lives to what you have done, how you have come to us, you've lived your life of ministry, revealing the glory of your Father the plan and the mission that you were crucified on a cross, that you were buried in a tomb and resurrected three days later, and that you ascended into heaven, that you gave us the Holy Spirit. And we pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would move within us. That's in Jesus' name, amen. As we are in a season of Lent, a time from Ash Wednesday up to Easter, uh, I was recalling uh, my first Monday Thursday, and uh, you know, that's always a, a weird word for us, and it seems uh, sometimes that Christians come up with these uh, names or these acronyms or these things to mean something, and it becomes a tradition. Ultimately, Monday Thursday is uh, that day before Jesus is crucified, and uh, it was my very first time being in a church uh, and being a part of a service on a Monday Thursday, the pastor a few weeks beforehand had asked me to prepare some words and to share uh, at the chapel time that Thursday. And so uh, not knowing uh, a whole lot of anything, I uh, am not ashamed to say this, I had to get on Google and Google some Bible verses. And I came across this Bible verse, Hebrews 11, 1. And I'm like, that sounds great. That talks about faith and, you know, the story of the disciples having to have faith. And so I, I chose that one. And as I planned and prepared and, and I even met with a pastor and we went through the talk because it was supposed to be 15 minutes long, uh, it, I, was, I was prepared. I wore a suit, believe it or not, and uh, get in that chapel. And, and all these people had come in the morning because they do their Monday, uh, they do all their Holy week services in the morning and it the organ stopped playing and it was my time to come up front and to deliver the message and I remember being so nervous and I got up front I read the scripture and all I remember is it was like two or three minutes long and I said um amen or the end or something and I walked down and my head was held down and I, I walk by the pastor in the front row, and he mumbles to me, we'll see you in seminary. And I thought to myself, wait, what are you saying? If, if you didn't hear anything in the message, did you look at the clock? You had an expectation, 15 minutes. It was like two or three. I, all these people came here, and I let them down. I was beating myself up. And then after the service, we met in the hallway afterwards, and, and he began to film my cup and help me understand what took place in that service as I was beat myself up over time and this and that he said we have been praying for you and when he said that something happened to me something inside me not only as a person but in my spiritual life you see up to that point I I didn't have a deep understanding that Somebody could pray for me, and I didn't even know it. 
And it was that moment that really launched me into a, a really deep spiritual journey and asking the questions and seeking God through prayer and through study and ultimately into seminary. But that's not why I'm here this morning. I, I want us to wrap our minds around this one point before we get into the word. And it's simply this. Jesus has prayed for you. Jesus has prayed for you. And that takes place all throughout Scripture, but there is specifically one spot that I want us to turn to this morning. And so if you brought your Bibles with you, I want to encourage you to open those up to the Gospel of John, chapter 17. And if not, the, the words will be here on the screen. And we're going to read through this and uh, break this down a little bit as we talk about it. And I'd like to begin in chapter 17, verse 1, and the context of how we get here. In chapter 16, Jesus is in dialogue with the disciples, and ultimately the disciples come to a point and say, we understand who you are. We get it now. And Jesus then moves to this moment. Verse 17, or chapter 17, verse 1. After this, Jesus said this. He looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. I want to stop there for a moment. Jesus begins this prayer with a common posture of praying. He's looking towards heaven. In other translations, it says that his eyes were turned towards heaven. And then the words, Father, that hour has come. Jesus speaks these words out of the confirmation that the disciples finally understood who he is and why he had come. There was no hesitation and no doubt for them now that he is the Son of God. We hear this response in chapter 16. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. And up to this point, Jesus would respond all through his ministry by saying, my hour has not yet come. If you recall the, the wedding, his mom is asking him to do these things. like, my, my, my hour has not yet come. But here in this prayer, in this moment, Jesus is saying, it is time. Jesus is praying that he would be glorified as the deity, as the Son of God. A reference point all the way back to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus recognizes and acknowledges it is time. It's time to be crucified. That's how his prayer starts off for us. Verse 2, we continue. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those who have given him. And if you're an underliner and you have your Bible, I want you to underline this. Jesus prays this, verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I'm going to stop there for a second. Now this is eternal life, Jesus prays. That they would know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is the foundational truth of eternity that Jesus is praying. There is no other option. There is no other plan. It always has been and always will be Jesus. I want to bring in a little bit of application for us. And so I'm going to do this throughout the, the process here of this message. And if you're taking notes, confirmation students, I want you to write this down. Your application point one is this. Jesus prayed that we would know God as the only true God and Jesus Christ. Verse three there. 
All of us should hear what Jesus is praying here. And I want to zero in on our youth for a moment because there has been a lot of conversations, especially for our juniors and our seniors who are preparing in their lives their next steps. What am I going to do at college? Where am I going to go? What's going to happen? What's going to take place? The pressure's on. That's a common question you get asked when you get into that stage of high school. What are you going to do? What are you going to do for work? Your education? Who will you become in the future? Do you want to have a family? All of these questions start to arise. And we've all been there, all of us that are older. And we have had to come to the point of realizing that there is pressure upon asking ourselves what our purpose is. But this is my advice to you. Before you try to figure any and all of that stuff out, your first and primary purpose is this in your life. To know God is the only true God and Jesus Christ. If you know and have that purpose, everything else will fall into place. Ecclesiastes tells us in chapter 3 that God has planted eternity into each heart of humanity. Each of us have eternity planted in our heart. From we little to woe old, our purpose in life is God. But we sometimes get in the way. I would say actually most of the times get in the way. We're misdirected. We're not founded upon our essential purpose here to glorify God, to know Jesus Christ, to make him known. But right here we, we hear that this is the stamp, this is the final seal, this is the final sacrifice for our sin. Jesus is talking about. This is why. Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus is praying in the context before there was ever any of this here. Think about that for a second. Bring your glory as we were in glory together before the entire world began. And we read into verse 6. I'm going to read a very large chunk here. Jesus continues by saying, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of this world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. And I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they, will still, they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. He's talking about Judas Iscariot. Here's the application point two. Jesus prayed that our lives would bring him glory on this side of heaven while we're here. What does that look like in your life? You know, through this whole entire prayer series, we've had different opportunities to, to expose or reveal or, or maybe surface some different types of prayer, different uh, forms and function of prayer that you can step into. The question is, have you? And in those ways of prayer, have you been focusing on how we are bringing glory to God? It can be something as simple as serving breakfast such as what's taking place this morning to bring glory to God. Jesus continues in verse 13. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. 
Do you have the joy of the Lord in your life? It's a struggle some days. But do we have the joy of the Lord? Verse 14, I have given them your word and the world has hated them. Hmm. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is that is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them. That, that means make them holy, make them perfect, help them become righteous by me. By the truth, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For, for them I sanctify myself, that they may too, too be truly sanctified. Jesus prayed that we would have joy in him and that we would be made complete in him. And the practical application of that is how are we made complete first and foremost starts in the word. Jesus is not sugarcoating anything. He's very black and white. They held my word as truth and the world hated them. And Jesus tells us that in the the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are you that are persecuted for my name's sake. Did you not realize, or we should not be surprised, if people don't like us because we're Christians? If people know that you are in the Word, that you are deeply rooted in the eternal Savior, Jesus Christ, that there's going to be some tough conversations out there. And it's going to be difficult. But here's where we go next. As Jesus is praying this prayer, he's going through sections of his high priestly prayers, his purpose of being here, and and the glory of God into a a purpose for the, the disciples. And now we move into a section of his prayer where he is praying specifically for all of those who are yet to come to believe. He says this in verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. He's talking about the disciples who are already believers. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you and and me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them glory that you gave me. That they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Brothers and sisters, we are to become one in Christ. One in Christ as ourselves, one as Christ in our church, in our congregation, all for the glory of God that others would come to know Jesus through our oneness. Verse 24, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory and the glory you have given me because you love me for the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Application point four. Do we know Jesus and help others to know Jesus? There's a moment this past Wednesday, Ash Wednesday service was over and uh, Amy, the girls, and I and my parents, we uh, went to the healthiest place in town called McDonald's. And uh, we walk in and, and uh, I'm holding Maggie and I'm looking at the menu and there's a guy there with his dog and obviously Lou and Joe are all about this dog and, and I'm, not even, I'm totally tuned out to like everything going on in the room and this guy just turns and says, hey, I, I'm sorry, I've got to ask this. What's on your faces? And then everybody turns and looks at me. And I'm, what's going on? And, and I just like, I, I heard him say that and ask that, but then the pressure was on. 
And uh, a lot like that Monday, Thursday, I stuttered my way through some sort of uh, nice explanation of Ash Wednesday. And it was uh, a beautiful moment for my family to help me see, you know, Andrew, you have no problem getting up and talking in front of people, but boy, when it was one-on-one and you were under the gun, you struggled. And that was good for me. Practice what you preach, right? We don't know the given opportunity. And if you're praying for that given opportunity, get ready. Because God's going to put somebody in the most unusual place, unusual spot to ask you the truth about the gospel. And it's okay to stutter and mumble your way through something and, and, and hopefully you have a, a quick prayer like, Lord, give me the words, or you have somebody else with you that can help you out. The realization and why I share that is because we all have those moments that we have to be ready. And it's always. How are you praying in preparation for the opportunity to help somebody else to come to know Jesus Christ through you? Sure, it might not be the way you look, but it might be some of the ashes on your face or, or whatever might take place. Are we prepared? Do we know? As the disciples here have spoken, we now know without a doubt who you are. And this is the last point. Jesus prayed that we would be one as he and the Father are one. You know, there are so many things in this world that want to divide us. Not Satan's number one plan. Especially in the church. How do you how do you disorganize the church? You get the church to start fighting against itself. And Jesus is very clear to be one on the fact and truth that He is the Savior, that God is the one and only true God, and that the Word is true. You know, as Jesus ended this prayer, He went across with his disciples, the Kidron Valley, to a garden. And this is the garden where Judas betrayed Jesus and he was arrested and beaten, hung on a cross, crucified. But there's a significance that happens after this prayer, and it's easily overlooked. We read that they walk across the Kidron Valley. This is a valley known as a place of final judgment. It's a cemetery. They call it the Valley of the Dead. No words are spoken in that journey, just tells us there was a journey, that they crossed it. Jesus prayed for you and I, and then he immediately walked into death. To think about the scope of our lives, brothers and sisters. We are going to die. It's going to happen. What's going to happen at your death? Is there assurance It's their assurance that people know without a doubt in your profession and your confession of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and the way that you lived your life as a believer and as a disciple, as one. Because we know Jesus has always been plan A. And it's for you and I to come to know the truth 
of what is offered. And this morning we have the beauty and the opportunity to partake in what is offered to us. See, Jesus was with his disciples and he was explaining to them what was going to happen. And he's in an upper room with his disciples and he lifted bread. And he gave thanks to his Father in heaven and broke that bread and said, Take and eat, for this is my body, which has been given for you. In the same way, he lifted a cup. And he gave thanks to his Father in heaven and said, drink from this cup, for this is my blood which is poured out for you and for many the forgiveness of sins. This is the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. And so this morning we, we come forward to the table, an open invitation. And I don't know where your hearts are at, if you've been on the fence, if you've been there, if you're not there yet. An opportunity, a moment for you to pray, Lord, here I am. I want you to be my Savior. Lord, here I am. I've I've been walking with you. I've known you as my Savior. Help me. Strengthen me. Give me the faith to be bold. We also have ashes up here this morning. For those of you, as you come forward, if you would like to receive the image of the cross and the ashes on your forehead or your hand, we invite you to do that to to recognize and acknowledge that we've come from dust and we will return to dust. So would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Holy Spirit, our God. We ask and pray now that you would move in our lives, that you would reveal in us through this bread and this juice the truth of your word, the truth of your action upon the cross and in the resurrection and ascension. We thank you, Lord, for the beautiful gift of life and eternal life to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.